welcome. And I'm glad to see virtually or think about seeing you all here today. We're going to talk about Biosphere, and this is the second week of mapping and cartography in Geology 6351. And it's important for us to have a uh, science background uh, for us to appreciate the maps that we're going to be looking at, the messages they contain, and what we can do with our cartographic skills. And so the lecture portion of this course does contain uh, science background for your benefit. I don't have a textbook for you to purchase. Everything that you need is contained in the slides. If you want to research further, you're welcome to, but you can get all of the content from studying the slides. And that's why they're very wordy uh, because they are designed to replace a textbook and hopefully reduce cost for you as a student. Okay, so today uh, this will be delivered to you in three parts and we're going to go through an introduction. We're gonna then jump into biogeochemical cycles and how energy flows in the Earth system. We'll talk about biodiversity, species loss, and ecosystem function. And we will conclude with soils and sustainability, how the soil supports different types of ecosystems and what we can do to sustain that. Okay, whenever we study something, it's never in isolation. So any environmental issue that you look at needs to at least consider what role that little portion that you're looking at plays in this complex system that we call a biosphere. And so here are some components. Um, I'll start with the larger one and then I'll work my way down. So the biosphere really includes anything that is living. And so it's all of the plants and the animals in the earth. It's also the natural resources that provide the ecosystems for those living things. And so uh, a biome is considered to be a division of the biosphere and the different biomes share categories with each other. And so for example, in this slide, here we would have a tundra biome up here at the very top of the earth, and uh, this would be subarctic in the blue, and uh, then we um, have other biomes that you can see here that are represented. The next level below biome would be an ecosystem. And so um, an ecosystem is generally considered to be a collection of organisms that are within a specific part of a biome. And so now we're getting more similarities. And an ecosystem is not only the living flora and fauna uh, within that described area, but it's also the resources, primarily water and soil, as well as atmosphere. Within ecosystems, we have smaller subgroupings called communities. And so communities are organisms that rely on each other and that interact with each other. So you can have species within the same ecosystem that don't interact with each other. But generally, when we go down to the community level, now we're looking at the day-to-day -day activities, the cycles, the seasons, the years, and how the individuals in that particular community will interact with each other. And so in this depiction that you can see here, we have some moose and rabbits and a beaver, uh, a type of mountain lion or cougar and an owl. And so uh, they're all inhabiting this part of a uh, forest. It looks like an evergreen forest. And so they are a community because their lives are intertwined and they rely on each other and interact with each other. Now, ultimately, everything on Earth is connected. But when we talk about specific effects, direct effects and direct links, 
it's important to think about these ecosystem component components within communities. We have populations. They're generally considered to be of the same species and don't think it's just animals. So we have a group of elk here. And also we have populations of the different plant species. And so anything that is the same species interacts as a population. And so remember, when we're looking at these ecosystem components, this population is all connected to each other. There might be elk in another part of that ecosystem that is not part of this population or this community. And then within populations, we have individuals. And so when you do research and when you consider research, for example, if you're studying the movements of animals, often the actual data that you collect will be on the individual. But you want to be looking at scientific questions that address how's the population behaving, how's the community behaving. That's ultimately why most people want that information. Let's say we put a tag on uh, this elk here. We want to know how this elk is behaving in the community and probably at the ecosystem at large. And then we might tie that into larger studies of biomes. Okay, so energy is also a part of an ecosystem. And let's think about energy pathways. And so a feeding relationship between organisms in an ecosystem it was is what makes an energy pathway. There's something called trophic relationships. And so when we consider trophic levels, now it's a different way to divide up an ecosystem and it relates to energy flowing through a food chain. Organisms that are feeding at the same level are considered to be the same trophic level. And there's usually between three and six levels within any ecosystem. It begins with primary producers. It ends with our detrivores, or I'm sorry, detritivores. And the detritivores are those organisms that are responsible for breaking down organic matter and freeing the nutrients. So earthworms are a large example. The fungus and the bacteria within an ecosystem are very important in breaking um, down that organic matter in the soil and processing it. Um, there are some larger detritivores, and so vultures are a classic example, and also some of the carnivores are sometimes considered to have a detrivore or detritivore, I'm sorry I keep mispronouncing that word, detritivore function and so they will break down animals and then the, the true um, detritivores will break down into uh, the smaller parts into nutrients. So here is a graphic depiction of that uh, definition that we just went through. And this one is showing you um, five levels. And um, sometimes you'll you'll hear the term food chain. It's more accurate to think of a food web because it's rare that you have a chain of plants and animals that are only eating or being eaten by one thing. Um, so if we look at something as a food web, there are many arrows in this example showing you that the connections are complicated and they're not one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. They're rarely one-on-one. -on -one. So an example of a food chain might be in the tundra where you have a type of seal that only eats arctic hare and that arctic hare only eats grass and there's only one type of grass in that community because of the arctic nature again it's rare there's very very few examples but let's think more of a food web and again there's many many relationships and so at our first trophic level we have our photosynthesizers they're converting suns energy into a usable form for other organisms. And we also have organic matter um, at this trophic level. And uh, here's our fungi and bacteria and their primary role within a trophic level are to decompose and to break up organisms and make organic tissue more available, say, for nutrients in the soil. Uh, nematodes are also included in this group with our fungi and our bacteria. Our third trophic level are 
Now, our uh, shredders and uh, we're starting to get into predators and um, grazers. And so now we're looking at small animals and um, arthropods are um, shredders and they can also be uh, predators. And so larger uh, arthropods will feed on smaller arthropods. And then we have our fourth level, which is a higher level predator. And now we're looking at birds that are preying on arthropods that are also preying in turn on smaller arthropods. And then at the highest level of a trophic relationship, we have our high level predators and they tend to be mammals and uh, humans are almost always a high level predator in any food web that they are involved in. Okay, another uh, example for you uh, to show you an oceanic version of a trophic relationship. So our primary producers in the ocean are the phytoplankton, which are the floating plants and the seaweed. We have herbivorous consumers. So this is a little bit different terminology than the last slide. And so a consumer is something that is uh, going to rely on the primary producers and they are eating directly those primary producers. So if you are vegan, you are an herbivorous consumer in your food web. Our first level carnivores are the ones that are consuming the herbivorous consumers. And then we have our second level carnivores that feed on the first level carnivores. Uh, we could have a third level carnivore that is feeding on second and first level, and then a top carnivore. Now, one thing, again, it, you want to keep in mind, this is not just a straight chain. When we're trying to understand a concept, we will draw out a model. And this pyramid here is a good example for us to get a basic understanding of what is happening. We know the world is very, very complex. And if you are going to go into ecology, if you're going to do a project in ecology, then there's a lot more complicated information that needs to go in there. So uh, just please keep in mind that we're learning basic concepts here. Once you understand the basics, then you can start factoring in levels of complexity. Within any trophic relationship, we have uh, always energy heat loss, and this is uh, thermodynamic energy. We have incoming energy ultimately from the sun, which is processed by primary producers into consumable types of energy that uh, we have our consumers and our carnivores and uh, our carnivores and herbivorous consumers are all relying on these primary producers to convert sun's energy into usable energy, which you might think of as calories. And we have our decomposers that are playing important roles at every stage, as you can see by all of the arrows. Another example showing you a different kind of food web in a riparian area, um, uh, wetland. So the idea here is that there are interrelated food chains. A new term we hadn't talked about is omnivore. There are many consumers that will feed on both producers and consumers. Most humans are omnivores. They eat plants and other types of consumers, which are animals. In some cultures, it's uh, bugs and insects, and they're not very popular in the United States but in other parts of the world they are. So our primary consumer here, uh, this cricket may not be on your dinner plate, but if you do um, travel to Asia, for instance, you can get crickets and they're very popular as snacks in markets, much like we eat popcorn at the movies in Asia. There are a lot of places where you can eat crickets as a snack. Uh, okay, so again, Appreciate the details of this type of energy pathway. It's just showing you uh, different representatives from a different ecosystem. So now we're looking at a wetland where uh, we do have decomposing plant and animal matter. They're present in every 
type of energy pathway. We have our primary consumers, and then we have our secondary consumers are the small fish that are eating uh, the zooplankton and uh, grazing on the diatoms. We have our secondary consumer, which in this example might be a frog, and our uh, ducks are also secondary consumers. And then uh, the large fish are what are called tertiary or third level consumers, meaning they're eating the small fish, they're eating possibly frogs, and um, some fish will eat ducks, usually the, the smaller ducks. Our producers are represented by our trees and our plants. And again, here we have a bird, which is a secondary and tertiary consumer. They will eat grass, uh, but they also eat the protein and the fish. And then we have upper level uh, consumers, um, secondary consumer of a bird. And then the top predator in this particular ecosystem would be a uh, bird of prey or a uh, hawk in this instance shown here with a snake that it has taken from somewhere. And so it this is a better example of how it's not a straight line and the pyramid is a good representation for understanding some concepts but as you can see here it is rarely just uh, a chain or a straight line that there's a complex interaction. And then, as always, please be aware of this uh, heat component that there's always heat entering into, or there's sunlight energy entering into a system, but there's always heat escaping um, from that system. Another one for you to consider, again, I really want you to understand the complexity of a food web. And here are our uh, floating plants in the ocean called phytoplankton. The grazers on these plants can be zooplankton, which are floating animals in the ocean. And then uh, we have various levels of consumers represented here. One of the primary roles in an ocean of the phytoplankton um, is to convert sunlight into energy. And one of the primary roles of grazers is um, when they die, they contribute to what's called dissolved organic matter. And so this is where nutrients are going to sink down into the bottom and they become available in shallow waters for oceanic plants. And so this diagram is a little bit misleading in that um, in these ecosystems here, you would be thinking, okay, this is getting to be deeper water. You wouldn't have grass on the bottom in deeper water. So that's just, um, again, very simplistic model. It's very useful for us to understand basic concepts at this point. So to summarize, with trophic levels, the producers represent the lowest level. The primary consumers feed on the producers. They're usually called herbivores or vegans, if you're human-centric. Uh, secondary consumers mainly eat the primary consumers. They're termed carnivores. And then our tertiary consumers will eat everything. They're the top of the food chain. Very, very important, but not always appreciated, are the detritivores and decomposers that are feeding on detritus. And so their job or their role in the trophic level is to take dead organic matter produced by living organisms and then they break it up into smaller nutrient parts to be available. So we have our often considered to be lowly, but if you're a biologist, uh, sometimes beloved worms, centipedes, snails, slugs, and then our bacteria and our fungi. There's inefficient, inefficiency in an energy pyramid because as you move through the levels, you decrease the amount of energy that is available. So with each level of a pyramid, we only have 10% of the energy that is passed from one level to the next. And the most efficient use of resource happens at the lowest level. So let's take a look at what this means. So when we say that there is a decrease in energy, let's look at the producers here represented by this grassy area. And the estimate, just for simplicity's sake, is that there's a 1,000 kilocalories per square meter. That means that in every square meter of this grass or crop, 
there is a thousand kilocalories of energy. Now, the primary consumers have access to this energy. However, with the primary consumers, if you had a square meter of primary consumers, there's only 100 kilocalories of energy available. With secondary consumers, now we're also going down by another factor of 10. So the snakes that eat the grasshoppers, there's only 10 kilocalories per square meter. And then at the highest tertiary consumer level, there's one kilocalorie per square meter. And so this illustrates the decrease in energy available as we go from lower to higher trophic levels. And kilocalories is a scientific term for it's the same thing you see on your food packaging called calories. A calorie is a measure of energy. It's strictly defined as the amount of energy necessary to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. And it is very familiar to most humans as um, the energy that we need for activity and bodily functions. So a kilocalorie is really the scientific term for what you're used to seeing as a calorie. Okay, in the bottom part of this figure, um, what does this mean in terms of resource management? That is a part of this course. And I want you to think about the notion of feeding a growing population. So we are, we've bypassed 7 billion. We're quickly on our way to 8 billion people that we share the planet with. And that's human biomass. And so in order to feed humans, um, if we eat um, just the beef, we need to feed that beef wheat um, in order for us to have access to the meat from the beef. Okay, and so this side is representing um, if we if we do um, feed this beef 810 kilograms, we would be able to utilize approximately um, 81 kilograms of beef from the feeding of this wheat. Now, the potential for the humans to actually eat part of that 81 kilograms is shown here in this purple. Uh, polygon. So let me kind of simplify this. We need to feed the cows. So we feed them the wheat. We get this much represented by the salmon colored polygon, this much um, weight in cows. But the human's potential to utilize that resource is this purple polygon here. This is how much a human could expect to get from this amount of wheat. Now, if we were to directly consume this amount of wheat, the amount of energy we would get is represented by this purple polygon. So it's showing you that there's a great difference in feeding a resource, the wheat, and then eating the resource from that fed wheat in the terms of the cows and actually eating the wheat itself. And so one of the proponents for a sustainable world and uh, sustaining a growing population is for people to eat more vegan and more vegetarian meals. All right, going back to energy pathways, uh, biological amplification is the concept that chemical pesticides will concentrate in food webs. And there are collections of for example, long-lived, stable, and soluble types of chemicals, and they collect in the fatty tissues of consumers. They become increasingly concentrated at each level, and this is biological amplification. Uh, DDT and birds was a big issue that was addressed in the 70s, and the realization that this DDT was accumulating in the tissues of birds and not only killing off populations, but also affecting human populations led to the eradication of most use of DDT. And fish in the ocean is a great example. You've probably heard of uh, the most common one that is talked about in mass media is the accumulation of mercury. And with the popularity of sushi, the accumulation of mercury in the tissues of tuna. So what's happening is that the smaller 
phytoplankton are processing the mercury in the ocean and then the zooplankton are feeding on that and the mercury collects in their fatty tissue and then the small fish eat it the medium fish fish eat the small fish and then the tuna which is a large predator eat the medium fish all of these fish are collecting greater and greater concentrations of this chemical in their fatty tissue and it is such an environmental concern so much so that they recommend that pregnant women not eat tuna and if that doesn't alarm you it's something that I've always pondered about well why is it only uh, pregnant women it's probably not good for other humans as well it's a very sensitive time when a fetus is developing but uh, mercury in fish is a big problem okay a little bit more information um, with um, thinking about habitat adaptations and niches. So communities we know are interacting populations of plants and animals that occur in a particular place. Now we're thinking about what is a habitat? Well, the habitat is the home of an organism. So the community is the collective interactions but the habitat is actually the home and the habitat is necessary to fit a species need. So we'll be looking at maps um, of land cover change. We'll be looking at maps of different habitats, uh, deforestation and things like that. So the habitat is the trees, the water, the sunlight, all of those resources that are supporting this colony of seabirds that you see here. And this habitat has various needs in terms of, again, nutrients, water, space, soil, and energy coming into it uh, to support not only the plants that you see, but also the birds. When we look at adaptation um, from an evolutionary perspective, evolution is the process in which the first single-celled organisms changed and diversified over time. And this eventually produced the world's millions of species of organisms. A species is defined as a population of organisms that can reproduce sexually and produce fertile offspring. Charles Darwin is one of the most famous scientists that studied this phenomenon. And what he said is that based on his, these observations, he believed in the theory of evolution. And these observations were that more organisms are born than will survive. So there is a mechanism in nature of producing more than can ever possibly survive. Numerous offspring are not identical. They inherit, inherit variations of traits. Um, organisms engage in competition for survival, and those that are better equipped will survive reproduce and pass on successful genes to the next generation or to offspring, which is a biological term. There's a lot of controversy with evolution and I am a geographer and my background, my undergraduate was a biology degree and I worked as a marine biologist for 10 years. And it's important when you think about evolution to separate out the controversy. It's it was never the biologist's interest to argue evolution versus creation. Uh, I will tell you, whatever your beliefs are, that that is an argument that was initiated within religious sex. And so evolution didn't really say some of the things that creationists are arguing about. And it isn't saying that there isn't a creation possibility and that that the notion of evolution was always intended to be about change in organisms. And it got very controversial about where did humans come from. So for the purposes of this class, understand these traits of evolution, please. Okay, successful organisms will possess traits or adaptations. Let's take a look at, at that part of evolution. So some animals or plants have different characteristics that enable them to survive. And the process of natural selection, which you may have heard survival of the fittest, is that those organisms that are best adapted to the environment and that can change with a changing environment will be successful in uh, passing on their genes or in reproduction. 
So again, this idea of a universal common ancestor is what evolution is all about. And if we follow the lines of this diagram, um, what we're seeing is that um, if we if we start at the top, and I'm not going to start with humans, I'll start with something um, that isn't quite so controversial, that we have a certain type um, of bird that is considered to be very advanced evolutionarily. And the idea is that the ancestors of most of what we experience in our present time as birds came from dinosaurs. And then their ancestors were also dinosaurs. Before the dinosaurs, there were reptiles. And before the reptiles, there were fishes. And um, before the fishes, this is a bony fish, there were cartilaginous fish. And then if we go back down, we can see um, that all of these, what are called vertebrates on this line that I'm showing you right here, link back to a last universal common ancestor. Okay. If we were to consider a more primitive animal, for example, a jellyfish, a jellyfish is what's known as a cylinterate, and the cylinterates are very, very close to the last universal common ancestor, meaning that jellyfish haven't changed over evolutionary standards in hundreds of thousands of years. They're very, very similar to what we think of as primitive jellyfish. Okay. All of these protozoans, sponges, echinoderms, and then bryozoans, brachiopods, mollusks, etc., all of these are different branches of what would be called the universal tree of life. Again, quickly going through plants. So we have advanced plants in terms of evolution, and these are the uh, deciduous leafing plants that um, we are familiar with. Well, before that, there were evergreens, and those type of plants are considered to be more primitive than deciduous plants that grow in areas where they adapt to seasons and um, change. Losing their leaves usually is the biggest change. Before that, there were ferns and mosses on land. Before that, um, there were seaweed. So there is an evolutionary change. So this niche concept means that in an ecological niche, that is a sector of an ecological ecosystem where every organism has a job. And that niche is where the organism fits into the bigger picture. It's determined by physical and biological needs of an organism. It differs in each habitat. And while many species can exist in the same habitat, their niche is a unique role that it performs within that habitat. Okay, so let's look at an example of two birds that occupy the same habitat but they exploit different resources. So we have a white-breasted nuthatch and a brown creeper. They both eat insects, but the brown creeper, if you look at its bill, it will travel into the upper areas of the tree trunks and it probes into the bark with a sharp bill. Whereas the white-breasted nuthatch on the left has a less pronounced and rounded bill and it allows it has feet that allows it to travel down the trunks of the trees and it feeds on insects in the lower part of a tree trunk therefore these two birds while they are living even on the same tree they are avoiding competition because they have competitive exclusion they're not eating insects from the same part of the tree so with competitive exclusion, it means we have two species that will occupy the same niche, but they're utilizing different parts of that uh, area. And it reduces competition and it maximizes reproductive success for both species. Let's think about the idea of symbiosis. This is where two species are associated in a way that benefits at least one of them. There's three different kinds of symbiosis. With mutualism, both organisms benefit, and so they're both gaining a benefit. An example of mutualism is a coral reef. So the uh, coral gets nutrients from the uh, zooxanthellae, and the um, 
plant organisms that live inside the coral and the the plant organisms get somewhere to live and the coral get the nutrients from the plant organisms. They both benefit. Parasitism, on the other hand, one organism benefits and the other is harmed. So most of us, most of us are familiar with worms, either in our pets or humans get worms too, not very often in the United States. Uh, but in parasitism, there's really not a benefit to the host, but there's a great benefit to the parasite. It gets nutrients from its host. And then commensalism is where one benefits and the other is relatively unaffected. Um, and so an example of commensalism is barnacles on a whale. The whale isn't really that affected by the barnacles, although it seems uncomfortable that it wouldn't um, be very uh, convenient or uh, ideal to have barnacles growing on your skin, but it doesn't really harm the whale and they don't get nutrients from the whale. The barnacles get nutrients from the water. So here's some other examples. Uh, with mutualism at the top in A, we see both a fungus and an algae, and these two organisms together make up lichen. And they, um, they both benefit, and so the Algae make nutrients from sunlight, and the fungus breaks down nutrients from the soil and rock. And so this is, lichen is a really interesting organism that can live in very, very, very harsh environments because the lichen can get nutrients from either the rock or soil or sunlight. And so all possibilities of nutrients coming in, flowing through a system are available to a lichen. And that's why you see them in really harsh areas like the Arctic tundra. With parasitism, we see here, this is an example of mistletoe. Most of us are in the U.S. are familiar with mistletoe at Christmas, but in an ecological system, mistletoe is sort of a nasty uh, creature, not creature, nasty plant. Uh, it lives on trees and um, the mistletoe benefits. It gets nutrients from the tree as well as from sunlight, but the tree itself is actually harmed and enough mistletoe will choke and kill a tree, stripping it of its nutrients. And at the bottom, we have another plant example of an orchid and the orchid will live on another tree but the tree is not harmed the orchid does not use its root system to get into the nutrient system of the tree it just uses the tree uh, as somewhere to live okay abiotic means non-living and so the abiotic components of an ecosystem are very important on the distribution of ecosystems so when we think of air and soil temperatures precipitation and water availability, water quality, day length, or amount of sunlight available. These all contribute to what is known as a life zone concept. And this describes the zonation of plants and animals at different levels. So in this graph, we have a continuum here based on a latitudinal zonation and a vertical zonation. The latitudinal zonation is considering increasing latitude starting at the equator and moving up to the poles. At the equator, we have tropical rainforests. Higher latitudes, we start to see the temperate deciduous forests. At the very, very high latitudes, or they're the higher part of the mid-latitudes, is a uh, collections of needle leaf forests. These are also found at elevation. Um, moving closer to the poles, you will find tundra and plants that are resistant to actually decreased amounts of precipitation and decreased temperatures. And then finally, we have ice and snow at the very highest latitudes. There's also a similar pattern if we consider vertical zonation. So now we're not moving away from the equator, we're moving away from sea level. And so within one very uh, tight range of latitude, you can go, um, if you go up a mountain, so for instance, let's pick uh, there's a there's a Fox Glacier and it exists in New Zealand, which most people tend to think of New Zealand as being tropical, 
and green and most of it is but if you go high enough in elevation um then you will get this zonation. So we start at the sea level with a tropical rainforest. If we go up the mountain, there's our temperate deciduous forest. Even higher up is um, needle leaf. Keep going up that mountain, you'll see tundra. And then at the top, you will have ice and snow. So there are limiting factors that affect distribution. We have physical, chemical, or biological factors that determine species distribution and population size. You can have too little or too much of something. Uh, low temperatures, lack of water in a desert, too much water in a bog, and a lack of active chlorophyll are the primary limiting factors in an ecosystem. A specialist is a species that can only live in specific areas. It has very tight constraints on where it can live, uh, usually related to food and uh, environmental conditions. And so an example is pandas. Pandas uh, only eat bamboo, and so they're restricted to the areas where bamboo grows, among other things. A generalist is a species that can live almost anywhere. And if you're familiar with the concept of rats, then you know um, that they can live uh, just about anywhere. Let's take a look at a map. And um, this is an example of species interactions and distributions comparing coast redwoods with red maple. So a coast redwood has very specific needs of precipitation, which are not found throughout most of California. There are narrow ranges along the coast of soil and nutrient type combined with the amount of precipitation that these types of trees need. That's why they're found in this narrow band of red that you see on the left of this map in the Pacific coast. Whereas the red maple is not just a coastal species, it has a wider range of variables that it can live in. And so you see a much greater distribution. With an ecosystem, they are often vulnerable to disturbances like windstorms, flooding, wildfires, volcanic eruptions, etc. And with ecological succession, this is where an ecosystem is disturbed enough that most or all of its species are removed. And the area will undergo changes in species composition as new communities replace the old. This is showing you an example of wildfire disturbance. Wildfire is a very important part of natural ecosystems. As humans, we tend to think of it as drastic and devastating, which if it takes our, our man-made structures and human life, it is drastic and disturbing. But in terms of a wild ecosystem, it is necessary in order for a healthy ecosystem to have fire run through it occasionally. And many ecosystems are fire adapted. In fact, some species depend on fire. Um, they only release the pine cones or their seeds when they are touched by fire. And Another reason that fires are necessary uh, in a healthy ecosystem are that uh, these periodic smaller fires will come through and clear out brush and um, they will um, make the way uh, for the taller, um, the, the succession of other uh, types of plants to come in. And so when the forest fires are frequent, they won't get large enough to touch the taller tree crowns, but they do clear out some of what is called surface fuel. In the top example here is a fire suppressed forest, which is what happens near most human establishments, especially in the US. The fires uh, rarely happen and they are not allowed to spread if they do happen, if they can be contained. And what happens is that when a fire does occur, generally 
because of lightning strikes. It will spread quickly through the brush and then this taller brush has grown up because it's been fire suppressed for so long. This area is called ladder fuel and the fire will qu quickly spread up and then get to the tops of the trees and uh, destroy the tops of the trees. So ecological succession has to do with the coming back or rebuilding of a community. This is an example of a fire on the left. And then one year later, you can see um, that there's no, there are no bushes yet that are the size of what we can uh, determine was here before the fire. But you can see that the bushes and the grasses are starting to come back. And so we go from bare rock on a disturbed site without soil. And so the primary succession is the laying down of bits of dirt and soil. And then it's the beginning stage of an ecosystem when seeds come in and uh, start rooting down in that dirt that covers the bare rock. This is what's known as a pioneer community. And then the secondary su succession occurs um, when the soil is already present. The Hawaiian Islands are actually volcanic activity that's coming up from the seafloor, and that's why we have the Hawaiian Islands. And they're a great uh, study area for um, succession because when the lava is laid down, which is a continuous process in Hawaii, uh, we will see the emergence of uh, plants um, and um, here we're seeing grass and uh, shrubs on the hillside, but right in the thick of the lava is an earlier uh, successionary development of these uh, ferns. Another area that is being studied for ecosystem disturbance and succession is um, the area around Mount St. Helens. It erupted in 1980. And even though this slide says present, um, a disclaimer here, present was in the early 2000s uh, for this resource, and it's even developed further since then. And so there is a continuum of intact ecosystems that weren't affected by Mount St. Helens right up next to ecosystems that are in the process of developing. So it's a great study site for botanists and ecologists um, to look at succession. Aquatic succession also happens. This is a, pro a process represented here called eutrophication. It's defined as the gradual enrichment of water bodies. This comes from plant material and organic debris. We go from open water condition up here of a lake as we get increasing amounts of debris that are settled into this lake. It is um, accumulating sediments and crevices develop and there is an increase in the floating plants and submerged plants as well because now as this bottom is shallower, uh, you can have sunlight reaching this area and so we get more plants that establish and eventually this process continues on until you get swampy waterlogged areas. So if you've ever been in the swamps of Southeast uh, United States, uh, Florida, Louisiana, um, those areas have uh, a lot of uh, swampland. And so this is one of the primary processes by which a swamp is created. When we look at stability and resilience, so if something is stable, it's constantly changing, but not diverging greatly from its original state. So there are fluctuations, but it doesn't go very far from a baseline or a stable point. And resilience is the ability of an ecosystem to recover from a disturbance. So some ecosystems have evolved over millions of years in order to be resilient. My example of the fire that you saw before, that ecosystem is designed to be resilient and bounce back from fire. Now, if we look at these examples here, uh, before the disturbance um, and um, before the fire, the ecosystem looked like this. And then afterwards, everything was cleared away. And so now we see different kinds of organisms that are quickly adaptable to an area come in. And so you can see that the after disturbance is very different than the before. Now, 
again, for humans, fire is devastating or a disturbance. We don't like to have uh, tornadoes rip through our areas or fires burn down our urban developments. But for an ecosystem, sometimes it can be more resilient after it grows back. And what happens is that um, uh, an area that has been disturbed uh, by a natural phenomenon, it still has a lot of nutrients available and there's a lot of uh, space in terms of sunlight, air, and soil that's available to these newly colonizing organisms. Um, here is an example of a before disturbance and then after. So again, you can see that we have uh, different, um, these smaller uh, plants are coming in after these larger plants were, or trees like objects were eliminated from the area. Okay, so biodiversity is affecting, um, being affected by human activities. This is uh, something definitely um, that we are aware of and that we know. And um, this is a really important transition here. And so I'm going to end uh, this lecture right here and we will pick up with the next part on biodiversity. Thank you for listening. Take a break and uh, come back when you're ready.